Street, went out to our aircraft, and we took off about 7 o'clock in the morning and flew over towards uh, Naples. The world has been at war for almost four and a half years. Germany occupies most of Europe, but is under attack in Italy, a country which started out on the Nazi side, but has now joined the Allies. We had a total of about 244 bombers in a long straight line out towards the target. The target this day will become perhaps the most controversial of World War II. It is the Benedictine Monastery of Monte Cassino, founded by St. Benedict himself in the year 529. It has been destroyed and rebuilt twice and remains the spiritual heart and light of the Benedictine order of the Catholic Church. Now that I'm here, you know, I wondered why the hell we ever came up here, try to get up here anyway, you know, when you look at us. War is destruction. Bombs, shops or palaces are destroyed if they're of military importance. As the Allies fought their way up through Italy, High Command had laid down a strict policy of protecting religious monuments unless they posed a real danger to soldiers' lives. If we have to choose between destroying a famous building and sacrificing our own men, then our own men's lives count infinitely more, and the buildings must go. But the choice is not always so clear-cut as that. In many cases, the monument can be spared without any detriment to operational needs. That order was about to be tested at Monte Cassino. Look, this monastery was 1,500 years old, the oldest monastery in Europe the first monastery at all. On this day there are no German troops but perhaps 500 Italian civilians in the monastery. Unfortunately it was a very clear day so it stood out like a sore thumb. About 9.25 we dropped the bombs. Now, I wanted to see just how successful it was going to be so I left the my pilot seat. So I went back to the bomb bay and I observed the, the bombs dropping. And the first 12 bombs of my aircraft hit right in the, the entrance cloister of the monastery. We had a rather easy time of the mission. There was no German opposition. Uh, but this, this was offset, I think, by the sensitive n nature of the, of the mission, being a uh, a religious shrine. That, uh, this brought about all kind of controversy after the war and it continues to, to this day. A New Zealand general, Sir Bernard Freiburg VC, war hero from the First World War and commander of the Second New Zealand Division, made the decision to bomb it. To answer why, we have to look at the entire Italian campaign. The Allies arrived in Italy after driving the enemy out of North Africa and Sicily. As well as being a possible attack path to Germany, fighting in Italy would help take the pressure off the Eastern Front and France, where the main D-Day landings were planned. The aim of the Commander-in-Chief on the spot was to make sure that the German divisions, already in Italy, uh, were fully occupied so that they couldn't be transferred to prepare for the Second Front, which they obviously knew that was coming, the invasion of France across the Channel. Leonard Thornton was a senior staff officer at General Freiburg's headquarters during the battle. The Italian autumn is fast turning into winter. Mountains lie ahead. Along narrow winding roads, Kiwi armoured units are moving up to the front line. Already early rains threaten to make it sticky going. If we were asked what the casino campaign was like, we could wax both eloquent and blasphemous. If I merely use our New Zealand idiom and say it was a proper cow of a campaign, I think you'll know what I mean. 
The Reverend Pat Goody yeah, was the 18th Park. Battalion's padre. He also carried a small assignment. movie camera filming Kiwis in action. Casino is still a puzzle to him. For who, in the depth of winter, would willingly attack the almost impregnable fortress which Casino, the Abbey and Mount Cairo wear? In winter time in Italy, it's uh, colder than c central Otago and uh, the snow is there and uh, a lot of rain and a lot of mud. We had no days off for three months, not a day. And the stuff was coming in all the time, you see. So you never had any spread. You couldn't just go away. It would be ridiculous because somebody's going to die. It was terrible, it really was. Uh, war, it's not actually the fighting, it's the conditions. And the conditions we, we were in, we were on very short rations, cold. I'd never been so cold in my life. We were soaking wet day and night for about three or four months. Two army groups, the British 8th and the American 5th, were battling up Italy. By the start of 1944, they'd run up against the Gustav Line, which stretched right across Italy. With their supplies coming in at this Italian port, the New Zealand division is getting ready to move north to rejoin the 8th Army. The New Zealanders were late in joining the Allies in Italy, having spent months retraining and re-equipping to become a fully armoured division with their own tanks. The Kiwis were soon to be given the lead role in trying to break through. But ironically, the advantages gained from becoming fully mechanised would be useless at Casino. Italy would be one of the world's best rearguard action countries to fight any war with a handful of men. No matter how many armies you got. In the Italian winter, the Battle of Monte Cassino was fought with modern weapons, but a supply system which dated back into prehistory. The men with the most mules had the edge. It took so long to reach the front lines that senior officers often had little idea of the conditions their men were living and fighting in. Supplies could be sporadic as loads were simply lost. It didn't help that the Allies were up against some of the toughest soldiers in the German army. Joseph Klein fought with the famed paratroopers, the Fallschirmjäger. It was much easier to fight in this territorium than in Russia. They were very fine troops and the Germans considered them the, the corps d'élite of the German army. I don't know whether you know that the, that the Russian soldiers, or Russian troops, didn't get uh, German uh, prisoners. They didn't, get, they didn't take German prisoners. And uh, that, uh, therefore, we fought even more stronger, of course. Field Marshal Albert Kesselring commanded the Germans in Italy. On the Allied side, General Harold Alexander was Commander-in-Chief Mediterranean. Under him, General Mark Clark led the 5th Army. And beneath him, General Freiburg commanded the New Zealand Division, which he led for the whole war through Greece, Crete and North Africa. He concentrated day and night on the uh, destruction of the, the Bosch. John White was General Freiburg's personal assistant, carrying the General's camera and writing up his war diary. The Kiwis were different to other troops. General Freiburg had a mandate from the New Zealand government which gave him total control of New Zealand soldiers. He didn't have to obey orders from his superior officers if he didn't agree with them. But at Casino, Freiburg would follow orders and commit men to battles he was not entirely confident of winning. Freiburg felt the Kiwis had to play their part in the great conflict, but the shots were being called by the Americans. By 1944, the full weight of the United States had been thrown into the war in Europe, and the Yanks were taking over. In Italy, it was an American failure which set the ground rules for much of what happened at Casino. The tranquil village of St. Angelo, five kilometres from Casino, sits on the far side of the Rapido River. Trying to force a way across the fast-moving river in mid-January 1944, 
the Texas division was all but annihilated. Fields of poppies now marked the scene of an American rout. The aim was to smash the German defences south of Casino and break through into the Leary Valley, which would open up the road to Rome. Those poor beggars, uh, I feel sorry for them. They, they went through hell. Oh, yes. They went through hell. That, they, that river, that repeater, was a river of no return for them. They were shot at before they got on their boats to go across. They were dead before they got over the, got the other side. They just about wiped out the 36th Division. Pride of Texas, there. Yeah. British troops at the seaside resort of Gator had also failed to break through the Gustav line. French Moroccan mountain troops had more success in the hills to the east of the casino position, but their supply lines were simply too long and the mules available could not haul enough ammunition and food for the French to beat the Germans. In an effort to bypass the Gustav line, the Americans staged an amphibious landing up the coast at Anzio. The landing craft were on short-term loan. High Command needed them back in England for D-Day. Opposition at Anzio was light, and six US Corps got ashore almost unopposed. The road to Rome was finally open. A few days and the Germans at Casino would be isolated and forced to retreat or surrender. Yet unbelievably, the American general in command at Anzio failed to take the initiative, and instead of moving out, consolidated, giving the Germans time to mount a ferocious counter-attack which came close to driving the Allies back into the sea. Anzio was fast running out of steam and would hang like a cloud over Casino. It somehow slowed down. Uh, perhaps the, the command was not very effective and it really became a liability for a time. And it was because that landing force, about 100,000 men, was uh, threatened by German counterattacks that we had to act so vigorously at Casino to try to save the day, keep the German forces from moving against the Anzio bridgehead. New Zealand soldiers who fought at Casino have come back to revisit the battlefields. Fifty years after the war, veterans visiting Anzio are still bitter about the American indecision. To this day, they cannot understand why the Americans didn't take the initiative. It was too easy and they just sat back and had a cocktail, I think. <laughs> they really, you know, it's, it's hard to comprehend, but um, it happened. Well, we felt pretty lousy about it because uh, in the end it was us that, well, all the troops from the casino that uh, more or less rescued these up here. You know, they were stuck, finished. At New Zealand headquarters, Yankee General Mark Clark, the Allied Commander-in-Chief Italy, is paying a formal visit to 6 foot 3 General Freiburg and the NZ Division. Clark had called in the Kiwis in early February to continue the assault against Casino. While the American general would later criticise Freiburg, relations between the two men at the time was reported to be excellent. Freiburg was given an Indian division along with British and American artillery units to form a New Zealand Corps. At Casino, the Germans had spent three months with thousands of labourers preparing their defences. They'd even flooded the entire valley, ensuring that any attack would have to be made along the only access road, Route 6, or the railway line. Attacking Casino was not a task that any general would relish. To attack Casino on the narrow front uh, and attack the uh, centrepiece, the uh, Monte Casino, on which the Abbey stood, uh, well, uh, in the in the winter conditions, was a not on situation. If if you hadn't had the imperative of Anzio hang over your heads, is it, is it likely that uh, at Casino you would have just hunkered, hunkered would down have. for the winter and waited till? Yes, I believe we would have dug in and hung on there and got ready, perhaps to do the spring offensive a little bit earlier. By my book, it well, it had to be fought. I think General Freiburg said. To General Alexander, if we don't do it, does somebody have to, else have to do it? And they said, yes, well, we're not going to, say, be accused of taking the easy stuff. And I think that's in our history books, too. Mm. To make matters worse for the Kiwis, the Allied Air Force was almost fully occupied staving off disaster at Anzio. 
Freiburg could have air support for just one day, and it wouldn't necessarily be on the day he wanted it. That's a German ME-109 taking its last dive. Freiburg also had to decide what to do about the monastery, which sat smack in the middle of the German lines. Designed as a fortress, it was widely believed to be occupied by Germans. An American spotter plane had even confirmed that. Militarily, it was the prominent point in the dominant feature of the Gustav line at that position. And to think, to see it, uh, or to, to believe that it was to be treated as immune uh, was almost an impossible thought for people who were going to attack it. At lunch in Rome 50 years later, the attackers still remember what it felt like fighting in the monastery's shadow. Gosh, we had the Germans looking down on us, we were down below, and it was a terrible feeling. And we were heartily pleased to see the monastery bomb, where I was, and most of the other people, because it was a menace hanging over our heads. A Vertreter des Vatican empfängt von einem deutschen Offizier das Verzeichnis der aus dem Kloster geborgenen Stücke. In a highly publicized operation and with the blessing of the monks at Monte Cassino, as the war approached, the Germans removed much of the monastery's archives and art treasures and stored them in Rome. The Axis also publicly promised not to use the monastery for any military purposes, but it was a promise not believed by the Allies. Völker nach vorn ist auch diesmal die Devise der Angloamerikaner. Neuseeländer, Marokkaner, Inder, Polen und Gaulisten sollen die erste Bresche schlagen. General Freiburg planned a two-pronged attack which involved seizing the railway station and the monastery. The Indian division was assigned the monastery and was to attack from point 593. What appears to be a gentle bump to the left of the monastery, but which is in fact extremely rugged country. Senior officers insisted before they attacked the building it be softened up, a euphemism for bombardment. They could see that thing up there and they were sure that Jerry was watching and, that, and they were convinced that he was in here. Um, the, I don't know whether they were or not. My feeling at the time was uh, let's flatten it. I'm not so sure it was a good idea now. Whether or not the Germans were using the monastery or caves directly underneath it remains an issue of conjecture even today. Uh, my, my soldiers go away from this place. <laughs> now tell me, were you in there? No, no. No, no, no. Nobody was in there. No. How am I going to solve my conscience? Uh, look, look, we had, had, we had, had need to be there. The New Zealand Corps headquarters was in the village of Savaro, tucked in beside Mount Trocchio, but still in the shadow of Monte Cassino. In the olive grove, a goat herder idly tends his flock. Fifty years ago, General Freiburg paced the same land as he considered the implication of the Indian demand that Monte Cassino be bombed. He had approved it, but because of the sensitive nature of the target, the decision went up two bosses higher through American General Mark Clark the British General Harold Alexander, Commander-in-Chief Mediterranean. On the 15th of February, all three men took turns to watch the bombardment from the garret window of Freiburg's headquarters. But it was the Kiwi General who'd carry the can for the destruction. I think he was almost literally between a rock and a hard place, and he made the only decision he could at the time. David Crooks looks from another window in another time. And with the benefit of history, this country's expert on strategic and tactical bombing, Air Marshal David Crooks, at our request, analyzes Freiburg's decision to flatten the monastery. There it was, poised on this hill, looming over them like some great menacing figure overlooking the battlefield. And indeed, uh, General Tuka, the 
commander of the 4th Indian Brigade, had sent a memorandum to Freiburg in which he virtually laid down as a condition of their commitment to the assault that the monastery be destroyed and furthermore that the building be destroyed by a massive air assault. So was it a proper application of air power? Well, if the purpose and objective was to destroy the building, then yes it was. There may well be questions as to the efficacy of having destroyed the building uh, and what that meant in terms of an ongoing defensive position. But if the building had to be destroyed, that was probably the only practical means of doing so. There were two major flaws to the bombing decision, timing and application. Even though the occupants of the monastery had been warned by gun-propelled leaflet of the impending destruction, nearby Indian troops had not, and were accidentally bombed as well. The uncoordinated attack was ordered to help the Americans at Anzio. It would ensure German troops at Casino were fully occupied. The Allies were determined to smash through the German lines, and the fate of the Benedictine monastery which stood in the way had been sealed. Unfortunately, the day it was hit, Brown troops were not yet ready to mount their attack. The Indian attack came a day and a half later. Now that, of course, is tactically quite ridiculous. If you're going to do a bombing attack, you must follow it up immediately with your infantry attack. That was just an altogether a mistake. Another mistake was bombing the monastery at all. In just four hours, more than 200 aircraft dropped over 500 tons of high explosive and incendiaries. It remains to this day the heaviest bombing of a single building. As it turned out, our bombing just caused a lot of rubble, which the Germans used to their advantage. I look upon it as, as a, just a waste of, of time and expense and, and despair. What remained of the monastery provided ideal defensive positions for the Germans, who quickly occupied it. The first half of Freiburg's plan had come unstuck. Down on the flats, two companies of the Maori Battalion were chosen for the attack along the railway line to seize the station. The weather was, uh, was a factor, and the fact that they couldn't, didn't get the support up to them, that the attack I suppose it, put it bluntly, that's why it failed. Had the Mary Battalion had the support, um, we were all sure that it would have taken us, that the station would have been taken and held. Successful attacks involve coordination, artillery, aircraft, soldiers, and behind them, engineers to repair the roads. The Maoris were desperate for heavy weapons and tanks to resist the inevitable German counterattack. The sappers had worked through the night to repair the demolitions, but when the moon rose they were spotted and shelled by the Germans and forced to stop just two gaps short of the Maoris who now held the railway station. To cover the Maoris during the following day, Allied gunners laid down a continuous smoke screen. We started on smoke at about quarter to ten, three rounds a minute. The total ammunition expended by the 4th Field Regiment that day was 10,600 smoke and just on 7,000 HC, which is a record for any one day in any British firing. Unfortunately, it was all to no avail. The Germans used the Kiwi smoke screen to move up tanks and infantry and force the Maoris to withdraw. And as soon as uh, the Germans uh found our position, they started blasting us uh, with their tanks. So there was only one alternative, was uh, to get up, get out. Somehow we had to get out. And I said, go. And so we took off and we had about 200, 200 yards to run and jump over the other side of the bank of the, the railway station. Uh, we were all wounded. But um, I said, carry on running. And we kept on running until we reached our headquarters. We passed a lot of our dead, we passed a lot of our wounded, but uh, at least what we did do is to get the ambulance boys to go through and pick them up. 
not quite the men we used to be. Oh. The history books generally agree that the Maoris were unable to hold the station because the engineers couldn't repair all the demolitions in time. Now an engineer who was there has put a fresh slant on the night of February the 17th. I felt that the Maori battalion were to some extent the cause of their own problems. We had started our first bridge before the Maoris had moved up to the start line and we were stopped. The uh, Colonel Young, he, not a Maori, but he was the commander of the Maori battalion. He came up and uh, ordered our boss, who was a Major Marchbanks, to uh, stop until the his instructions were until the success signal went up. Well, if we'd stuck to that, we'd still be there. The colonel was concerned that the noise of our bridging would attract fire, shell fire, to that area while his troops were moving up to get to their start line. The frustrating part for me was that I, I've always felt that if we hadn't uh, twiddled our thumbs for an hour and a half or two hours, we would have had the rail yard. Whoever was to blame, it had been a costly exercise. Of the 200 Maoris who began the attack, 130 were killed, injured or captured. Timing works like this, sir. The attack will be open by medium bombers, beginning with the B-25. And then, sir, the ground forces will move up. New Zealanders will lead the assault on time. OK, that'll button it up. Freiburg's next attack plan was codenamed Operation Dickens. It would involve bitter house-to-house -house fighting in rubble and deep craters, many of them filled with water. A relatively small number of soldiers did the actual fighting. Questions would be asked why more troops weren't poured in to take the town. It was, I would say, the most difficult battle that the Second New Zealand Division ever fought. We were up against the strongest position, I ever, defensive position I ever saw, and it was manned by the toughest troops, I guess, we ever fought against, and all the terrain and weather conditions were against us. I mean, that has its effect on men. I didn't know whether I was too far forward, too far back. There just seemed to be no one around. And I, I was moving from position to position because uh, I didn't fancy being too long in one place uh, in case the Jerry's had uh, moved and spotted me. <laughs> After waiting for nearly a month for the weather to clear, Operation Dickens opened with another massive bombing raid. With Anzio stabilizing, Freiburg was again given the full weight of the Allied Air Force in Italy. The target this time, Casino Town at the bottom of the hill. With almost total control of the skies, the bombers would have a clear run. The idea was to literally bomb Casino and the German defenders out of existence, so the Allies could finally drive through into the Leary Valley. We believed that that would so pulverise the town uh, and the defenders that they would really be smothered in the rubble and that our infantry would be able to sweep across supported by tanks. Two and a half thousand tons of bombs and artillery shells turned Casino Town into a moonscape, which bore no resemblance to the maps issued to troops. The plan almost worked. Unfortunately for the Kiwis, the town was garrisoned by German paratroopers, the corps d'élite of the German army. And even though they suffered 50% casualties, they were tough enough to come out fighting. You'd clear one site and you'd no sooner turn your back and they were back in again. They were very determined boys, make no error about it. One unforeseen effect of the bombing was that Casino was rendered impassable for tanks. The infantry would have to fight it out on their own with no armoured support. It's a little bridge, you remember the bridge? Yeah. You remember the tanks coming over? Yes. The Shermans? Well, in the direction of the bridge? When I was in, the, the tanks couldn't get into Casino because there was too many holes, too much water, and the road was all blown up. What happened, of course, is the bombing 
uh, due to the heavy rain and the winter we'd had, it just became a bog hole. It uh, delayed the tanks and uh, rather than drive the enemy out, it gave them ideal bunker positions, uh, which made their defence a lot easier than it would have done otherwise. All the time I was in Casino, I never saw a live German. And yet we lost a lot of our men because they were in the houses and shooting us and we couldn't see where it was coming from. Yeah, yeah, and we yeah. were just below that uh, yeah, Castle Hill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Castle Hill was taken, but Kiwi officers decided against pouring more troops into the town below. On the grounds they would only provide German snipers with more targets. We'll never know if more infantry could have taken Casino. It's clear to me that uh, General Freiburg wanted to put more infantry in, but he was a man that always consulted the opinion of his uh, subordinates, as you probably know. Uh, his subordinate at that time, immediate subordinate, was General Parkinson, who was now commanding the division when General, after General Kippenberger was badly wounded. He did not want, he didn't think that there was any point in putting more infantry in. He felt that if he had more infantry in, I think he was going to get more people killed. And certainly the brigade commander, uh, Brigadier Bonifant, he was also against flooding the town with infantry. So I'm undecided. I think it might, it might just have uh, won the day. We certainly would have had heavier casualties. The bombing of Casino was clearly a mistake. Pulverising buildings provides cover for defenders while denying access to the attackers' armoured support, the tanks. The same thing had happened to the Germans attacking Stalingrad a year earlier, and a British War Office study of that battle had concluded that mass destruction of a city would work in the defenders' favour. The report, unfortunately, had not been widely distributed. I think the lesson had been recognised, but it had yet to be learned. There were some Kiwi gains. The railway station, taken and lost by the Maoris, was about to change hands again. The landmarks that we'd mapped out and the roads to be our route just didn't exist at all. It was just a sea of rubble. And uh, we just came down and, well, it had, we had to make a, a reconnaissance on foot to find a way, got a, got, uh, found a way, got through, and on we came. Uh, what was the German resistance like at that point? What sort of opposition were they putting up? It, for a start, it wasn't bad. It was, it was, they held their fire, their machine gun fire, for the infantrymen who were behind us. I lost a leg at Casino Station. Oh yes, so, I see. Uh, oh, you I have been on the station. Yeah. Some of no, our no, members from the first parachute uh, uh, engineer uh, battalion took them uh, the, this station back. Yeah. yeah, they took hey. the station back, and then I got yeah, it back again yeah, after yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> after yeah, the war, they changed the sometimes. War. Yeah, it was becoming obvious even to the ordinary infantrymen uh, that uh, this was a bit of a shambles in, in the fact that the prime objective of breaking through at this point was becoming more and more remote. Two days after Jim Furness's tank took the railway station, Jim Moody was in another tank inching up the rugged Cavendish Road behind the monastery, emerging at Albanetta Farm to the astonishment of the German defenders. There was, for the first moment, no reaction at all. They could drive through along the Albanetta and we are just about shooting position up to the uh, monastery of Casino when uh, our weapons started to knock them out. Né? And it was good to have started from the behind and not from the front because they couldn't turn around or they couldn't uh, escape and so all of them were finally uh, damaged. Fifty years after the battle, tank man Jim Moody meets the commander of the anti-tank battery which stopped his column. Yes, right, fifty years. It's impossible. You tell that somebody won't believe it, no? He won't believe it. For 17 tanks, I killed two of these tanks, no? See? That's after fifty years we met here, no? Terrific. First we shot at each other, but... Should give you a big Kill each other like crazy people, no? Oh, that's delightful. It's nice of you all to uh, take an interest The also. war is crazy, every war. No? Yeah. For what for? What absolutely. for we fight here? For yes, nothing. Absolutely. No? Yeah. See, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 
Arriving at an Italian aerodrome today is one of the latest York planes. This giant transport, twin brother to the Lancaster bomber, brings the Right Honourable Peter Fraser and party to Italy. To greet Mr. Fraser is General Sir Bernard Freiburg. Mr. Fraser has come to see for himself how the New Zealand division is faring after six months of hard and bitter campaigning in Italy. Fraser visited Casino just days after the Allies finally broke through the Gustav line. Dead poles still lined the road to the monastery. It was a sobering experience to see the devastation up close. The monastery had been an elusive target, captured finally by the Polish corps when the Germans withdrew. With such odds against them, Casino had been too tough for even the Kiwis to crack. But the way they fought brings pride to the New Zealanders looking down on all that is left of Casino town. It was like hell, I mean. It was a bloody fighting, you know. But we did it. And I'm so glad it's all over. And I hope there will be no more fighting. But it was rather an anticlimax, no heroics. Uh, the actual occupying of the monastery, the Germans had withdrawn uh, during the night. And uh, um, actually, I was. Uh, my, uh, my regiment sent out a patrol uh, that uh, was to verify that they had withdrawn. What was, your, what was your feeling at that time? Did, what, 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 what did you oh, I was elated, absolutely, after all. It was, well, we could do it, you know. We had, we'd done it, you know. It was so difficult. heavy losses sustained by the Polish corps and other attacking formations necessary at all. But to me it was a useless battle anyway in the first place, but then of course that's in retrospect isn't it? Probably a battle that should never have happened. We got round it in the finish so why couldn't we get round it earlier? Casino was a defeat for the 2nd New Zealand Division. The Kiwis suffered more than 1500 casualties, 343 were killed outright. Another 42 were taken prisoner. With the benefit of hindsight, it is easy to see the mistakes made and apportion blame. General Freiburg has copped his share. You have to judge a man uh, against his contemporary time. And at that time, dynamic leaders were needed. And uh, it was necessary to pursue the enemy and uh, to bring about his defeat. He was also a very firm man and, and uh, one who didn't mind speaking his, his piece. And uh, so I, I think he, he, was, he, was, he was a tough general. And sometimes you have to be that way. <laughs> and his time, he was immensely valuable. And we should, uh, we need to remember that. You can't judge him uh, in the light of today. Freiburg's men were meant to be a mobile armoured force exploiting a breakthrough others would make at Casino. When the general was told his troops would have to make the breakthrough themselves before the tanks could roll, he accepted the task knowing he had only a 50-50 chance of success. He had this quality which has been discussed uh, as being the the, the hallmark of great leadership, rob, of great leaders, robustness. He showed a stamina, both physical and mental, which I have never seen uh, equaled by anybody I've met in military or private life. The monastery was rebuilt after the war to look exactly as it had before. 
the Benedictines were determined it be where it was and how it was. For many of the old soldiers who came back to Casino, it was the first time they'd actually set foot in the monastery they helped destroy. Soldiers from both sides are drawn back to the building which dominated their lives for three long months in early 1944. What's that word? Kattel. There was one bridge along here on Route 6. Every night for a week we built it and every day for a week you blokes blew it up. And that's where I got my leg blown off. I think it's sad really sad that all this should have to happen. The whole thing in retrospect was stupid. We should never have been fighting. But we did our best, didn't we? Yes, <laughs> all of us. You know, we did our duty. No, all of us did it. Right. Nobody has learned. You see it nowadays all over the world. We are much more wars and there are much more casualties as in times of the last war. And I just are singing when people will be understand that peace is the worst, most worthful thing in the world. Beneath these western skies they lie, comrades of yesterday, the blood of my proud forbearers, the flower of my race. They sleep where none other but warriors sleep upon the battlefield. Beneath the hand of two their Lord, and beneath his martial grace. So sleep ye sons of the long white cloud, in death you have excelled, triumphed to the foeman threat to right, who have cherished long. And in the blood that you have spilt, a new world shall rise, with Christ, the rich, the poor, and for us all, sleep ye sons of the long white cloud. <laughs>